Hello, I'm Bruce Koala, National Product Manager for Chip and Coolant Systems for LNS America. I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for your attendance. I've been with uh, LNS for 21 years and uh, I have had this position since 2007. Uh, today we're going to talk about chip conveyors and their appropriate applications. I'd like to thank our uh, global product manager and R&D manager, Jamie Towers, for his help today. Jamie is going to be answering any questions that you might have as they come in. And uh, you'll find that there's a question and answer icon, and you can press that to uh, type in any questions you might have for us. Uh, if you have difficulty opening it, give it uh, open and close a few times, and it normally will open without any trouble after that. Again, uh, thank you for attending. So let's talk about choosing the proper chip conveyor. Choosing the chip conveyor at one point in time was quite easy. Uh, 15 years ago, it was normally a hinge belt conveyor that was selected 95 to 90% of the time. Today, our figures show that number has dropped to 50% and often that 50% is uh, misapplied. Here's the lineup of our chip conveyors that you see at the bottom of the screen starting from our uh, non-filtering conveyors, which is the hinge belt and the magnetic on the left. In the middle, we have the start of our filtering conveyors. It's the MH, and then to its right is the SFC, and all the way to the right is our Microfine 2, Microfine 3 conveyor designs. Uh, what has changed to dramatically alter the conveyor manufacturers are choosing? Over the last 15 years, machine spindle speeds have increased dramatically, especially on the machining center side. Uh, coolant flow rates for their traditional use, in other words, cooling the tool, and to move chips inside machine cabinets have increased dramatically. Multitasking machines have become more and more prevalent. Uh, lathes have great milling capabilities. Here's a photo of a uh, lathe that's doing a long shaft turning operation. You'll notice the spindle that's holding that turning tool also can be a rotating spindle. So with a uh, tool change going to a milling cutter, you can also do some substantial milling on that same part and the same operation. Mills have turning capabilities, which would be the reverse of what we're seeing here in this photo, but it would be the same, uh, would create different kinds of chips even in the milling machine. The result of all these changes has dramatically altered the chip formation on any given machine. The chips are smaller and lighter. The coolant keeps them in suspension. Remember the, the, the amount of chip or coolant that's being used that allows those lighter chips to stay in suspension. And then the coolant washes the chips into the machine sump at an alarming rate. So the questions are simple for uh, for leading us to the select, select, excuse me, selection of the proper conveyor. Uh, will you be machining a dedicated material or mixed materials? Some examples would be steel, brass, cast iron, plastic, uh, aluminum. Uh, also, a large number of other materials are machined, but these are primarily the ones that we see on a continuing basis. Uh, what is the size and configuration of the chips? Coarse or stringy, like you see here, or fine, like you see below that, or a mixture of all. The mixture of all is where we get into a lot of problems. What are the specifications and requirements of the machine tool? This is the other thing that we need to know to lead us to the proper selection of the conveyor. Here's an example of a uh, conveyor in a typical turning machine. The coolant flow we need to know for all the pumps. Again, flow rate is critical. The conveyor pocket design is something that we need to know. How much room do we have to actually fit the conveyor? And horsepower is the final consideration. The reason horsepower is important is we have different grades of chip conveyors uh, for the different amounts of horsepower that we see. If we have a high horsepower machine, we want to put a super heavy duty conveyor in it. Uh, that's another reason why the conveyor pocket design is important. Sometimes we don't have the room for it, so we have to know all of those factors in order to get us to the right uh, conveyor selection. So let's talk about hinge belt conveyors first. Again, those are about 50%, so we should cover them. 
And this is what the hinge belt conveyor looks like. Uh, it's still the most popular. It's versatile, it's affordable, it's very reliable, and again, it needs to be used in the proper application. It's good for coarse and stringy chips. Here's some stringy chips that are on a chip stripper bar that's located underneath the uh, conveyor uh, discharge area that have been pulled off of the belt. And it's also good for those larger sixes and nines. It is not good for fine chips. Fine chips will stay in suspension and wash right out of this conveyor because again, it's not a filtering conveyor. Uh, next, we'll talk about our magnetic conveyor selections. Here's our uh, magnetic conveyor. This is a slider face magnetic. There's a stainless steel slider face that goes from the tail of the conveyor all the way up the incline to the discharge. It's the best choice for broken ferrous chips because it's magnetic. They have to be ferrous, obviously. Chips have to be broken because we don't like to see long stringy chips on there that tends to break the magnetic field and then does not allow us to pull the chips out of the uh, machining process. It's ideal for cast iron. Cast iron always machines broken, so it's great for cast iron. Obviously, it's also ferrous, so it's a really good selection for magnetic conveyors. It does not offer filtration. Uh, typically, it does a really good job pulling the ferrous chips out of the process, but anything that's non-ferrous will wash out. And uh, what I mean by that is a lot of times in cast iron, you'll see materials like graphite, a little bit of sand get in there because they're not magnetic. They will stay in suspension and wash through. Because of that, in many applications, you see additions of uh, cyclonic filtration in the coolant tank and also uh, or also bag filters. Uh, this allows for the uh, removal of the non-magnetic materials out of the coolant, keeps the coolant life nice and long. Here's uh, the inside of the magnetic conveyor. This is what you see underneath the slider face. So basically you have magnet sets that are spaced at a, at a pitch. Uh, the typical pitch is 12 and a half inches. These uh, mag magnets are riding right underneath the slider face, being pulled by the drive motor that you see here. The drive motor is attached to the drive shaft. The drive shafts have sprockets at both sides, which interface with these chains. The chain is pulled by those sprockets as they're rotating. That takes this magnet set and pulls it along just underneath the slider face. Any of the ferrous chips that get a attracted to that magnet are then dragged along up until we get to the discharge area. When we get to the discharge area, the magnet pulls away from the slider face that eliminates the pull of the chips and then the chips drop into the chip hopper. So that's how the uh, magnetic conveyor moves the chips along. There's also a couple of other features that I'd like to talk about. One is that this particular magnetic conveyor is designed with um, uh, plastic track. The plastic track is impregnated with Teflon. That adds great lubricity for the uh, the tracking of the chain and therefore we never have to worry about uh, any uh, anything as far as uh, wear is concerned inside of that. Also there in this uh, rectangular shaped housing that you see down here at the end there's a uh, die spring and that die spring is putting tension on the back end of the chain so even as the chain wears it stays in constant tension so we really don't have to worry about maintenance on the magnetic conveyor. Now let's talk about filtering conveyors. Filtering conveyors come in three basic types. We have our MH conveyor which is uh, what you see here, the SFC, and also the Microfine 2, Microfine 3. And that's what would be on the right-hand side. So those are our three basic uh, setups for uh, filtering conveyors. Uh, the selection is based on filtration level and price point. So let's talk about filtration level first. How do we as a company decide what kind of filtration level is best to recommend for you? First of all, one of the things that we encourage is that you send us a chip sample of the chips that are getting into your coolant tank. With the chip sample, uh, we are able to put those under a microscope that we have at our facility in Kings Mountain, North Carolina, and that microscope generally will lead us to the proper selection of the filtering conveyor. Uh, here you see a one millimeter gap and a couple of small and a larger chip that are located underneath the microscope. 
In, in addition to that, we also have a nice slide that we use, which really tells the tale. And in this case, we have um, three different sizes of dots that you see here. The yellow dot represents our size of our 500 micron filtering material. The blue dot is our 250 micron filtering material. And the red dot is our 50 micron filtering material. So these dots are, uh, we're able to move these around and actually impose them on top of the chips that we get from your sample. And in this case, you can see the three dots that are uh, in alignment to this particular chip. And in this case, you can see that the width of this chip is um, smaller than the 500 micron filtration media. It's smaller than the 250 micron filtration media, but the 50 micron would actually block this chip from getting into the tank side of the uh, process. Uh, here you see a couple of additional ones here showing that the uh, 250 would not block the chips, but the 50 micron would. So with the, uh, with the chip sample and the analysis, it generally gets us to where we need to go as far as what filtration level to recommend for you. We also consider price point. Uh, in many cases, a, uh, a part that you're uh, machining, you, you might not be able to get enough money for you to use a, uh, a very expensive uh, capital equipment to take care of the uh, uh, situation. So in those cases, you might use a vertical machining center versus a horizontal machining center, for example. Uh, because of the lower price point of the vertical machining center, um, you might want to save some dollars and go with a lower cost uh, filtering conveyor. In this case, we, we offer the MHs. That gives you a good, um, a, a good filtration level, but also gives you a good price point. So and, and oftentimes it gives you a better ROI in those cases. So that's why we have so many different choices for you. Uh, this is a graph showing the price points of the various conveyors, starting with the lowest price on the MH500 going to the 250. And you'll notice that the uh, SF Compact slots right in between the MHs and the uh, Microfine 2s and 3s. So uh, this is often a good choice if you have a little bit lower price point, but you still need 50 micron filtration. Well, let's talk about the MH500 and the MH250 for a minute. Uh, there's what the product looks like. It's our lowest price point filtering conveyor again. It offers both the 500 and the 250 filtration levels. Uh, it does have interchangeable boxes that provide that filtration level. So if you do have a situation where maybe you purchased a MH500 and down the road your uh, application changed and you're making finer uh, chips and you want to have a little bit finer filtration, you can replace those boxes to the 250. For the uh, 500 uh, micron level, the actual filtration media is a punched stainless steel sheet. For the 250 micron media, because those holes are so small, we can't punch them, so we used an etched stainless steel material. It also is a sheet, so they're both very durable, but they do offer the different filtration levels because of the hole sizes in the material. The hinge plate has brushes attached to the bottom of the hinge plates every two feet to constantly wipe the boxes to keep them clean. There's a, uh, a rendition of the box. Here's the uh, filter box, the red that you see here. The media, filter media is at the top and the bottom of the box. And uh, in all filtering conveyors, the actual conveyor itself is welded watertight. So the only place for the coolant to go from the uh, machining area back into the coolant tank is through the filter media. As that coolant is, is flowing through the filter media, any small chips that are that stayed in suspension get trapped on top of the filter media and those have to be cleaned on occasion. So what we have again every two feet uh, is a brush assembly. The brush assembly uh, consists of aluminum extrusion that a brush is placed into. The end of the extrusion is crimped and that allows the brush to stay in place. As the hinge belt itself is removing the large chips from the operation. These brushes are moving along on the underside and they're scraping the fine chips off of the filter media and getting the box clean. So again, that happens every two feet. 
Because we have filter media at the top and the bottom, we also have to clean the bottom filter media off. So as the belt's moving back towards the tail, these same brush assemblies are actually doing the same thing on the bottom side of the box, keeping them both clean. So that's the way we, um, we keep the filter me our filter media clean. And it's self-cleaning, uh, continuously happens during the uh, operation of removing the chips. Now you might ask yourself what happens to all those fines that get accumulated in between the belt fights. Well, we have a specially designed hinge plate that opens to uh, allow those uh, fines collected to uh, have a place to escape. Uh, this is our live link. It's called a live link. This is patented and this allows for a nice opening to occur on the hinge belt itself. You'll notice that the live link is fairly heavy. So when the live link is on the upper flight of the belt, it's staying down. It doesn't allow the larger chips to get through into the middle of the belt flights. But as it goes around, gets to the discharge area and comes back down, Gravity allows the live link to pop open, giving us this nice large area to get the fines out from between the belt flights. So keep in mind that the fines are kind of staying in suspension. They've been um, stirred around by the coolant, by the movement that's inside there from the belt, etc. So as they stay in suspension, they eventually work their way into this slot. A couple of hinge plates down from this slot we have a special wiper cleat that has been developed and the wiper cleat will actually scrape those fines uh, along the bottom of the conveyor around the curve. When those fines get again to the top flight of the belt, now they have a way to get over to the discharge and the next time uh, those fines get to that discharge, gravity will drop them off into the chip hopper. So that's how we get rid of the fines. Now let's talk about the SF Compact. Uh, there's a view of the SF Compact. This is our, our most recent development. It's our lowest price point 50 micron filtering conveyor. It takes up the same amount of space as a normal hinge belt or as an MH, thus the name Compact. It uses a mechanical brush system on the inside of the filter boxes to keep the filter media clean. This is what the uh, mechanism looks like. There's a uh, pneumatic cylinder that's located in this housing. This is the housing itself that you see at the uh, incline of the conveyor. That, mechan that, uh, uh, that cylinder strokes back and forth. It's attached to a uh, shaft. That shaft is attached to a um, mechanism that's located, basically a cable that's located on the inside of this conduit that transfers the motion from um, from the incline around the lower curve. It's attached then again to another shaft and those shafts are attached to uh, brush mechanisms that are on, on the inside of the box. Here you see the brush uh, mechanisms, these yellow lines. Sorry, that's not a little bit larger, but you, you get the idea. So as the, uh, as the cylinder is stroking back and forth, these brush mechanisms are stroking back and forth, and that allows for the inside of the box to be physically cleaned. Also, this is down in the coolant pool, so because it's in the coolant pool, it's actually creating a wave as it's moving back and forth, and that wave is actually back flushing the filter media. In the case of these boxes, because we have the finer filtration level, we are actually using a woven stainless steel material versus the punched or the etched material on the MH. And it's a nice tight weave, so we're getting the um, filtration down to 50 microns. Uh, uses uh, external brushes too. There's a couple of external brushes located uh, like you had on the MHs uh, on a couple of the uh, bottom sides of the hinge plates. Uh, because of the internal brushes, we don't need that many, but uh, we, we do have a couple of them and that'll keep the uh, outside of the box filter material clean as well. Uh, we also use a special hinge plate to let the fines escape from between the belt flights, and that would be the live link. So the live link is used in this product just as it was used in the um, MH product. Uh, now we can talk about the microfine two and three. There's the microfine three. It's the highest price point filtering conveyors that we make, again, offering 50 micron filtration. Both designs are the same with one difference. 
Uh, the bottom of the lower conveyor of the microfine two goes under the upper conveyor, locking in the space needed to uh, fit the conveyor to the machine. So since this is a microfine three, if it was a microfine two, you'd actually have a portion of the lower conveyor coming underneath the upper conveyor, and that locks in the level that we can place the upper conveyor to the lower conveyor. So the microfine three bottom uh, does not go under the upper conveyor, and that allows more adjustability to fit in the uh, in, in, into a lower profile that we might have on a machine tool. So that gives us a little adjustment here. We do have to be careful because of uh, coolant flow, but uh, if we do need the space and uh, coolant flow is not the, the issue, we do have the ability to move this up and down. The upper conveyor is a hinge belt to take away uh, heavy, the heavy chip loads. And uh, again, uh, being filtering conveyors, these are all welded watertight. The uh, lower conveyor is a scraper with a drum filter providing 50 micron filtration. That drum filter is actually behind this housing and the drum filter is back flush to keep it clean. The uh, plumbing that you see here is uh, for the uh, coolant flow into the, that back flush mechanism. The, uh, this is what the drum looks like on the inside there. Uh, you see the sprockets on the outside, those uh, mates to the, the belt for the lower conveyor. And as the lower conveyor belt is moving along, it's rotating the drum. And as the drum rotates, uh, there's the spray bar that you see. Again, that spray bar is attached to this plumbing. It's forcing coolant to hit the back side of the filter media, which is flushing the filter media and keeping it nice and clean. And the rotation of the uh, drum allows for the filter meter to be cleaned all the way along the 360 degrees. Uh, because the size of the dual conveyor design, a replacement coolant tank is normally needed. So the MH and the SFC conveyors have the advantage of normally fitting in the standard machine conveyor pocket. Uh, because the microfine two and three are larger, they require a little bit more room, therefore they normally require a tank. And this is a uh, representation of that. Here you see a typical turning machine. You see an MH or an SFC fitting in the normal conveyor pocket. And you see the microfine two or microfine three with the extension that we need for the lower conveyor. We normally have to provide a larger tank to uh, allow that to fit in. Um, the final consideration I'd like you to think is eliminating the need for indirect labor to move chips in a manufacturing facility. A good solution is our uh, 3D disk conveyor system. Uh, it moves broken chips in, um, in that manner. This is a, a drawing uh, represents all of the different combinations that the 3D can actually be used. What you have is uh, here is, shows a large double column machine. You see a 3D system wrapped around it. It's taking the chips and dumping them into another 3D system that you see over here, servicing these three machines. Uh, this 3D system is obviously in a trench. Here, this 3D system is at floor level, so we can trench it or it can be at a floor level. In this case, three, these three machines are being serviced as well as the double column machine, and that's taking chips uh, overhead where we can clear the aisles for the plant and into a uh, trunk line. And that trunk line is then depositing the chips to a uh, single discharge location. Here you see a, a representation of another line of machines down this way. And here we're taking uh, the, in the same situation over to the trunk line for the single point discharge. In this case, this is trenched as well. So uh, they, can, they can be above uh, ground, it can be at ground or it can be below ground good versatility in 3D. This is how the chips are moved inside of uh, the 3D pipe. So basically we have a chain. There's disks that are welded at a pitch distance uh, to that chain. And as the chain is being dragged through the pipe, the, uh, the disks are actually dragging the chips along with them. Uh, we have different size uh, pipes starting at four inches. Uh, going up to 10 and uh, the size of the pipe will be determined by the amount of the chip load that we have to move. So the 3D system is a versatile conveyor to provide a single point of chip discharge over a long distance. And uh, this is actually a installation that we've done. Uh, here you can see that it is actually a uh, in a pit and uh, 
or trough, and there's the coverings for them, which is uh, taken off, so you can see what the what it looks like down in there. And uh, here's that line in the facility. Here you see some very large uh, milling machines that were doing aluminum. Uh, they're being discharged here uh, from standard conveyors into the 3D system. This is a view from the other side of the plant where you have that really long uh, distance that this 3D system is covering, and that's dumping into another trunk line that's in a pit, which is then taking the chips out of the plant into that single discharge point. You know, you might ask yourself, well, why didn't we wrap this around and bring it on up? Uh, we could do that, but in this case, this particular uh, line was, uh, was too long. So if we do have a situation where we have uh, too much length, then we'll, we'll daisy chain the these things together and uh, uh, solve the problem in that manner. So that ends my presentation. Uh, I'm going to give you some contact information. If you think of a question maybe afterwards or might want to talk to us about something, feel free to uh, call my cell phone. That's my cell number, 513-256-4041. Or feel free to reach me at my email address. That's uh, bkoala at lns-northamerica.com. Um, I'd also uh, like to thank Jamie Towers again for his help in answering any of your questions that you have today. And I'd ask Jamie at this point in time if there's uh, any questions that maybe he couldn't get to or something that we might have to uh, elaborate some more on. Jamie, are you there? Hey, Bruce. Uh, yeah, a couple of good questions here for you. Um, First of all, uh, Johnny was asking uh, what kind of conveyor would be recommended for plastic applications? Plastic applications are, are difficult. Uh, it depends on the plastic. In general, we would normally recommend either a uh, standard hinge belt conveyor or an MH conveyor. They work ten generally best in plastics. Plastics are usually machined in very, uh, a very stringy manner, and uh, sometimes they have some, some fines, and we've had good success with, uh, with the MH when we do see some fines, and if it's just stringy, then uh, the hinge belt works very, very well. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, another question for you. So do you see coolant foaming issues with the Microfine 2 or the Microfine 3? Uh, we, we have seen coolant foaming issues on both of those products in the past. Typically when that happens, the uh, back flush pressure on the back flush mechanism is, uh, is set too high. And so as the uh, spray is atomized through the filtering material, it creates the uh, foaming issue. If, um, if, if that pressure is set normally correct, then we don't see the foaming issue. Uh, in, in a lot of instances, we have had great success using defoamers and those kind of coolants, but, uh, but, but that is a, a problem that we do see on occasion, it, but it is fixable. Uh, and okay, another question for you coming in fast and thick here, but uh, is the 3D system modular after install? Uh, is there uh, room for adding more machines in the future? Extra question, oh, I mean, an excellent question. I'm, I'm glad it was asked. I, I meant to mention that the 3D system is modular. If you uh, if you look at some of the, uh, the the pictures that we saw in the representations, you'll notice that the 3D system is actually linked together using flanges. So because of that, those flanges allow us to take the system apart and to add length or to deduct length or to maybe change the routing a little bit as uh, plant needs change uh, in the future. OK, and Jim has a question. Uh, what maintenance do I need to do on the MH conveyors? The, the, the MH conveyors are, are fairly low maintenance. The, the thing that I always recommend is to tension the belts on a regular basis. After the first two months of operation, we recommend that you tension the belt and then take a look at that at, at uh, six month intervals. The belt tensioning is done by taking the covers off of the discharge, by loosening the pillow block uh, bolts, and then using the adjustment screws on the pillow blocks to set the tension at 25 inch pounds. Uh, with the proper tension that makes sure that those brushes are constantly uh, uh, keeping the boxes clean. 
Also, uh, we recommend that you run the conveyor continuously whenever the chips are being made. Sometimes we'll see customers uh, will want it to, uh, to shut the conveyors off uh, temporarily. And the problem with that is when the conveyor belt is not running, those brushes are not uh, working to uh, clean the boxes. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. We've got uh, a lot of different questions coming in, but uh, I think we could be here for quite some time if we go through them. I think it's probably better if uh, the rest of them you can take uh, take separately afterwards. But, that uh, sounds good. Those All right, I'd like to thank everyone again for attending today. We appreciate your time and appreciate all of the questions and hopefully uh, you found this valuable. Thank you very much.